Hey, Law and Chaos listeners, this is Andrew Torres. We have a bonus episode for you. This one's a little different than our usual wheelhouse of breaking down the law, but we think you're going to like it because what we're going to break down is the 2024 presidential election. And in particular, what we're going to talk about is how to test some of the common theories about 2024 that the pundits have thrown out there, right? Is Donald Trump doing better with African-American men? Is Kamala Harris facing a backlash or lack of enthusiasm from college voters over Gaza? Has she made inroads among educated white voters? And, and, and much, much more. I'm going to be in conversation with a familiar voice to most of you who's an expert on the data that can confirm or refute these and, and other points that the talking heads are just yammering about. I really think you're going to enjoy it. So if, like me, you can't get enough of how to process the mountain of data that we've been buried under so far that shows no signs of stopping between now and Election Day, I think you're really going to like this special episode. And if you just want the law stuff, don't worry, we're still going to bring you all of our regular content on all of our regular schedules. So we will be back on Tuesday morning with another episode of the podcast, just like normal. With that in mind, let's get into this special episode. All right, Law and Chaos fans, with me today is Joe Dye, who is going to talk with us about the upcoming election. Uh, welcome back to the show, Joe. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. So why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about your background and, you know, why they should listen to you about the state of the election? So I've been working for the past four years in democratic politics and in mm -hmm. liberal nonprofit spaces, most recently with the ACLU of Florida. But I also have clients in a few different southern states, including Florida, Florida, Mississippi, Kentucky, et cetera, I'm working on a lot of races in the South. So excited to talk. Yeah. And when you say clients, you have drawn redistricting maps. So, you know, you really have your hands on the precinct level data that, uh, you know, at least insofar as anyone does, right? Correct. Okay, great. So let me ask you the easiest question in all of politics. What's the state of the presidential race right now? So as much as everyone's probably annoyed of hearing it's a coin flip, it's a coin flip. Um, I don't want to hear that. Don't <laughs> <laughs> I, I know nobody wants to hear that, but it, it, you know, in 2020, I, I think a lot of people really, and a lot of people in the media really sort of should have lost credibility for saying it was a coin flip because in those circumstances, it really wasn't. Now it ended mm -hmm. up being closer because the polls were wrong. But if you looked at those circumstances, it really shouldn't have been a coin flip. This is truly a coin flip. Well, this feels like it shouldn't be a coin flip either. I mean, you know, on the one hand, we have the sitting vice president of the United States. On the other hand, we have somebody who uh, dissembled on stage for 39 minutes. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that's a that's a good distinction. But but I hear you. So your first, I think, point that you're saying is it's closer than 2020. Yes. So if you looked at kind of the underlying metrics of the polls, fundraising, mm -hmm. things of that nature in 2020, President Biden had a fairly substantial lead at this point. And it ended up being, at least in the Electoral College, not all that close. Um, now, obviously, some of the states, right. some of the individual states were fairly close, but some were not. This election is probably going to be just as close. You know, your variance, like maybe, maybe Vice President Harris does a little bit better in some of the blue wall states, but maybe President Trump wins them by more than he did in 2016. Um, but your variance mm -hmm. is maybe plus three to minus three on either side which is just, it's just typically not the case. Okay. We have just published a written post of yours, your first on lawandchaospod.com. And that is called the Republican Feelings Industrial Complex. I've really enjoyed it. And let me kind of plug sort of the, the main thesis and let you, you know, elaborate a little bit on that. And, and that is, I, I think the public perception is, all of polling is wrong for all of time, right? Like it was disastrously wrong in 2016. Thank you, Nate Silver, for Wisconsin being deep blue on the final map on Election Day, uh, which uh, famously Hillary Clinton lost. That was not great. Uh, but then, you know, the polls again were off in, in 2020, as you just alluded to. Uh, President Biden had a lead outside the margin of error before Election Day, and uh, it, it turned out to be to be really close. And then in 2022, the polls all seemed to show that was obviously not a presidential year, that that was 
an off year cycle, but there were both congressional and Senate races. And the polling aggregates seem to show uh, Republicans making far more gains than they did. So what happened in 2022? Why, why do you think the, the data are more reliable than than maybe we think? So if you go back to 2020, a lot of pollsters who you know, showed a closer race um, than, you know, like, than, I don't want to say mainstream pollsters, but then, you know, more reputable pollsters kind of got this artificial bump because they were right in 2020. Mm -hmm. And it gave them at least some short term credibility. Uh, but part of the problem is that a lot of these pollsters were just complete right wing hacks. <laughs> Just to be frank. So there's a group called the Trafalgar Group, which is like fairly infamous mm -hmm. in polling circles for just and universally pan right wing, left wing. This isn't a partisan statement for coming up with just outlandish data to make it seem that Republicans were doing better than they actually were. Mm -hmm. And so in 2022, if you looked at like the high quality polling averages, which a lot of a lot of firms and a lot of forecasters are doing now. It actually showed Democrats and particularly swing Senate races doing a lot better. Uh, I think the example, the, the main one people think of is John Fetterman in Pennsylvania. If you looked at the total, po the polling averages from 538 and from some other sources, Fetterman had a, was about 1.2, you know, one and a half points down mm -hmm. in the total polling average. But in the high quality polling average, he was actually up by 3.4. Now they still undershot him. But it was a hell of a lot closer than the actual poll seemed. Right. Fetterman won by like five points yes. in that race, right? 4.9. Yeah. Okay. So if, if I could summarize what you've just said, essentially, if you look at 2022 and you take out the Republican garbage polls that are artificially inflating Republican candidates, the polling aggregate closely tracks the actual result. I mean, not, I wouldn't say closely tracks the actual result, but is much closer to the actual result. Um, you mm -hmm. know, maybe missed by like a point, a po you know, or two in all of these Senate races, not like six. Okay. Yeah. And if, if you want to know the motivation for why <laughs> Republican firms are propping up Republican candidates, go read Joe's post. It's available at lawandchaospod.com. Okay. So with that sort of as background to understanding polling data, how is that affecting 2024's polls? So- Look, the polls are still out there, but I don't think they're being really tracked or, or it, I mean, if you look at some right wing sources, you know, they'll talk about the Trafalgar group or, or other groups like that or Rasmussen reports. But if you look at, you know, reputable sources, they more or less either completely deweighted them or just excluded them completely for being some of, you know, some of them are like actually made up or, you know, that having the, uh, their thumb be on the scale uh, to. When, when, when you say made up, tell me what you mean by that. So there's a couple. There's a couple ways you can do this. I I'm not going to accuse anyone of actually making it. No, 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 no. I, it, we'll we'll say. Let let me give you the you know standard. Don't take legal advice from a podcast. Right? right. Now, all of this is for entertainment purposes. We are speculating. You're not offering advice. You're not uh, casting aspersions on the actual methodology of any particular pollster. Now, with all that in mind, <laughs> talk to me about how one could make up a poll. So. There's this thing called, there's two screens generally, sometimes there's more, but there's two screens with a registered voters and likely voters. And if you systematically exclude certain people who you claim will not, not be likely voters, uh, you can get different results than what your registered voters poll actually says. And now you probably should exclude some voters because, you know, some voters just may not vote, but it really shouldn't change the result by more than. 2% at the absolute max. So let, let me jump in and make sure that I understand, right? So using just standard mathematical theory, right? You can take a subset that, that will be representative of the larger universe of data if that subset meet certain conditions, right? So, you know, for example, one of the reasons why online polling is, is not valid is because it's not a random sample, right? Like people are highly motivated. You're, you're not hitting something that is actually representative of the group you're looking to do. 
Well, certain online polling is decently representative, but like a Twitter push poll is not representative. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, a poll, you know, when Elon Musk says, you know, should I bring back Alex Jones? Yes or no? And 97 percent say yes. Right. That's not representative of the universe of people that are on Twitter. So that that first what you've called a screen is the way in which you take your group of individuals that you've polled and then you apply mathematical principles to the data to make sure that it's reflective of the baseline of everybody who who might be registered to vote. And that's that's what we call registered voters. And, and what the actual electorate, you know, is probably going to look like in the state. Or if certain people who mm-hmm. you poll are not likely to vote, you can exclude them, like all completely valid, valid things. But realistically, probably shouldn't change your margin by more than a point or two. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a really good example of this. There was a poll done by a legitimate firm, TIPP, but mm-hmm. the likely voter screen was completely screwy. So they did this poll of Philadelphia of registered voters, Okay, found Harris up by three. I, I don't think Harris will win Pennsylvania by three, but she could. But the likely voter screen had Trump up by about one. Okay, A lot of folks were like wondering why. Well, what... What they did, what they did in the likely voter screen was they completely excluded. They completely excluded. They excluded ninety percent of uh, Philadelphia residents in order to get the desired result that they wanted. And so, in practice, <laughs> this would be this would be like if Philadelphia, if in the twenty twenty four presidential race, Pennsylvania voted, and then Philadelphia ninety percent of the votes in Philadelphia just didn't count. And in that situation, so again, let me make sure that I understand what you're saying. The likely voter screen is a subset of the registered voter screen. Yes. And it's usually almost all of the poll, but like sometimes they, they mess with it. Sometimes they oversample, but yes, it's, it's a mm-hmm. subset of the uh, registered voter screen. And that's where the polling sort of secret sauce takes place, right? Like it's it's trying to predict a likely voter screen that matches the actual composition of the electorate. And, you know, famously in 2016, Donald Trump energized an awful lot of people to vote who previously would not have been part of your likely voter screen because they were not likely to vote for anyone other than Donald Trump, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what you're saying is that this TIPP poll in transforming their registered voters pool to a likely voter screen, their filter discounted 90% of the votes from Philadelphia. So don't don't quote me on this, but I believe they sampled like 134 people in Philadelphia, 122, I think that's the number, maybe 127, said they were likely to vote, and they only included 12 in their likely voter screen. Okay. That- <laughs> and so I guess if you look at it, that if if, if what you're saying is if you discount all the Philadelphia votes and Donald Trump is only up in Pennsylvania by one point. That seems like pretty good news for Vice President Harris, as far as I'm concerned. Correct. I mean, I, okay, like, you know, it's just one poll, it's just, but it's just a particularly comical example because you didn't really even try to hide what you were doing. And you don't think that TIPP is trying to prop up Republicans. It's rather, or, or I, I get, let me not ask it as a leading question, right? Like, what's their incentive to have an interesting poll with a counterintuitive result come out? So TIPP's, the person, the group that funded this poll was a group called American Greatness, which sounds exactly like. <laughs> I, I what, pictured Eagle holding an AK-47, right? Yes. And so it. Again, I I don't know what happened, but it seems to me that whenever an American greatness sponsors a TIP people, the results seem to be kind of what Republicans want to hear. And I think this is kind of, you know, emblematic of just a greater trend in our society, particularly amongst right wing media, where Republican voters get what Republican voters want to hear. They don't, you know, want to get nuanced, balanced information. They want to get something that makes them feel good. Um, and this is why, you know, if you go, go look at the podcast charts, you know, go look at, you can read this in the piece, but go look at the podcast charts, go look at TV ratings, Republican sources dominate, you know, sources on the left that do this because just in my opinion, Republican voters actually don't want nuanced balance coverage. They want something that caters to their feelings. And this is why this is the whole kind of thesis of the piece. But, you you know, it's not long. Please go read it. Yep. Everybody should read it. So in kind of wrapping this up, if I'm trying to consume polling data, 
between now and election day, which uh, I am. <laughs> what what should I do to read that? Right, like how how do I know without digging into each and every one and saying, right, who paid for this poll? Oh, it's American Greatness. So oh, American Greatness is bankrolled by you know Steve Bannon or some mega goofball or whatever. Like, like, how do I parse when I just see a headline that says? You know, new poll shows Trump up one in Pennsylvania that otherwise would cause me to freak out. So ge- generally, the correct answer is just go look at polling averages. There's mm-hmm. a group, a new group of guy, a couple guys I know uh, called Vote Hub. I think uh-huh. it's VoteHub.us. They have what's called a high quality polling average. Really, really good stuff. Just A rated, B rated pollsters only. No, and they, you know, they exclude garbage internals and things of that nature, uh, like the TIP people you just heard about. And so I think those guys do a really good job. Again, polling, you know, 538 is fine. There's a couple of others. Nate Silver's polling aggregate on his Substack is also fine. But just look at polling averages. And again, Vote Hub, Silver Bulletin, uh, 538, all decent averages that weight appropriately. Okay. All right. Well, that is going to get us from now until Election Day. And Now what I want to talk to you about is how do I watch the returns come in on election night, November 5th? And before we get there, I want to ask you this kind of preliminary question first, right? Because a lot of people ask me and I don't know the answer to it. And that is prior to 2020, right? It was typical, right? It didn't happen in 2004. It didn't happen in 2000. but, But for the most part, we knew the election result on election day in in the evening, right? Even even in 2016, right? Like we knew at about 1 a.m., sadly, that that Donald Trump had won. So first question, are we ever going to be back in that universe again where we have a decisive answer on election night, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, even 1 a.m. that says this person won, this person lost? So I think it's possible, but not probable. Mm -hmm. So in 2022, if like not a great example, but there were some calls in those Rust Belt states and in Georgia and the North Carolina Senate race kind of relatively early into the night. So a couple of things to note about that. Those races like weren't actually all that close with the exception of the Wisconsin Senate race. None of the races in those states were like super, super close. Mm-hmm. And so if the elections are within, you know, a point in all these swing states, I don't think we're getting a call. If, you know, one candidate outperforms their their polling average, I think it's possible we'll know, but I don't think the networks will call it. Mm-hmm. And if we're waiting on Nevada or Arizona, forget it, because the Western states take forever to count. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. So I am then braced that we will not have... A result. I understand. We we could. I, I think uh, you'll have an idea, mm-hmm. but I don't. I don't. There. I don't think the networks will call it now. Okay. And we'll be back with more of that after this brief commercial interruption. Unless, of course, you're a subscriber at any level over at patreon.com slash lawnchaospod or on Substack at lawnchaospod.com. And we're back. Well, you're you're actually working on a second written piece for us, and I'm really, really excited about this one. And this is how to watch the returns come in on election night. And I will confess this, right? Like all day, I'm going to be anxious. <laughs> and the first, you know, and there's network coverage and you can try and parse through what the exit polls are showing based on how you know, various talking heads are covering it, right? Like you, you know, but, but that's, that's reading tea leaves, right? Believe me, I've done this for a long long time, like trying to figure out what those exit polls show and exit polls suck a lot of the times, right? So, okay, I'm starved for coverage. And then 6 p.m. hour comes and 6 p.m. Eastern, we should clarify. We're both. Yes. Sorry. We're, we are both on on, uh, Eastern standard time. That's right. So 6 p.m. Eastern standard time rolls around and the first two states to close, and it's not because of the daylight savings tie. It's not quite all of it, but it's Indiana and Kentucky. And it's like, OK, fine. Right. Like they're going to come in Republican. You know, yes, Obama won Indiana in 2008, but that was an incredible anomaly. Like by and large, it's going to be deep red. Who cares? 
you care. <laughs> so so tell me why at a high level. So the 6 p.m. hour on election night is almost just like anxiety no man's land. Um, <laughs> Indiana and Kentucky close. The networks usually just continue to talk about exit polls, which I would do too if I was on TV, mm-hmm. just, to be, just to clarify. But you can actually discern stuff from these results. But you really have to dig into the data, right? I mean, they're, they're going to yeah. come, they're going to get called early. It's going to put electoral votes for Donald Trump on the board. None of us are surprised by that. But what should we be looking at? Let's, let's kind of break down so some of that. Yeah. Here's what I want you to do on election night. Pull up the 2020 results uh, in Kentucky and Indiana. And as the results come in, kind of compare the 2020 results to the 2024 results, not because it's going to change anything in those states. But because those states are super correlated, particularly with the Rust Belt, and you're going to be able to get some, you know, because th- a lot of the counties in those states are pretty small. And so the returns finish counting really quickly. So you'll be able to get it. Once full counties are reported, you'll be able to get an apples to apples comparison. And if things are breaking a certain way, like, I mean, you probably won't be able to completely tell because maybe one candidate will overperform in swing states. Mm-hmm. But there. Indiana and Kentucky are particularly correlated with the Rust Belt. And by, and by the Rust Belt, you know, in particular in decoding that information, that is figuring out how Harris is likely to do in Pennsylvania, in Michigan, and in Wisconsin. Correct. So okay. the first thing I want you to look, look for is uh, Louisville and Indianapolis's black neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. So much has been made about how President Trump is going to improve on his margins with black voters. Um, I somewhat yeah, black men in, in particular, black, black men particularly, but black, you know, black voters in general, I somewhat buy that, but you'll be able to tell pretty quickly in, if you go to Jefferson County, Kentucky's supervisor elections website or whatever, it's whatever the analogous thing is named and same thing in Marion County, Indiana, mm-hmm. and you go look at the precincts that are super majority black. If there's minimal swing or no swing or Harris is doing a little bit better in those areas. It probably means that the polling was wrong and President Trump isn't actually going to make up any ground with black men. And so in, in that case, you probably feel reasonably confident that Philadelphia and Detroit and Milwaukee and the Rust Belt are going to, you know, the, the neighborhoods that are super majority and minority are probably not going to swing right. And if that, in that case, that kind of shuts off a little bit of you know, Trump's avenue to flip those states back. Okay. So I want to unpack that a little bit. So you're talking about Jefferson County, Kentucky, which is the home to to Louisville, the the city of Louisville, right? And Marion County, Indiana, which is the home to Indianapolis. And those cities are not like, right? (laughs) They're much smaller than Philadelphia, Detroit, and Milwaukee. But what you're saying is that those cities have a similar composition demographically to Philadelphia, Detroit, and Milwaukee. In other words, no, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Not, not necessarily those cities, but certain areas in those cities, um, mm-hmm. you know, like in, in Philadelphia, right? There are neighborhoods that are super majority black. Detroit is just the city itself is super majority black. And in Milwaukee, there are areas that are super majority black. Mm-hmm. Those results are extremely correlated with the results in Indianapolis's majority black neighborhoods and Louisville's majority black neighborhoods. So if President Trump isn't making up any ground in those areas and turnout is, act- is up, that's probably a signal that Detroit, Milwaukee, and Philadelphia aren't going to see a heavy minority swing toward Trump. And in that case, Vice President Harris has to feel pretty good. Albeit there are other things we're going to talk about. Sure, sure, sure. But what you're saying in kind of this first area is one of the things that Kentucky and Indiana can do on election night is help us test the thesis that Donald Trump has improved his standings uh, among African-American voters, particularly with black men. And so if these results come in and they look on a similar order to the 2020 results, then that suggests that hasn't happened. And if that hasn't happened, then again, that's a good sign for Harris. Yes. Okay. And then kind of putting that all together, right? Because that's what happened in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin in, in 2020. Donald Trump racked up huge margins in rural areas and then Democrats won those back by large margins in the cities in those areas, which, you know, led to the red wave, you know, red mirage, blue wave effect, uh, because 
the rural areas reported first takes longer to count in the cities sometimes by accident sometimes by design uh and that's why you show that's your department not mine yeah (laughs) but when we put this all together kind of this first area is a way to test the thesis that trump is going to improve his standings with black voters all right that's kind of bucket one let's talk about the next bucket so Louisville and Indianapolis sit in t- these two massive counties, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, Jefferson County, Kentucky, where Louisville is, and Marion County, Indiana, where Indianapolis is. Both these counties, similar to the Philadelphia Collar counties, um, mm-hmm. the suburban, suburban Detroit and suburban Milwaukee, although less so, uh, had major swings left from 16 to 2020, as Joe Biden did a lot better with Hillary Clinton in college educated areas, which, you know, these counties are big urban centers, and so they're going to have a decent number of particularly white college-educated voters. And if you're kind of looking for tea leaves as to how the Philadelphia College counties are going to look, or how Metro Detroit is going to look, or how Metro Milwaukee is going to look, you want to look at the Jefferson County, Jefferson County, Kentucky, and Marion County, Indiana results as a whole. And if if Kamala Harris is doing a little bit better. But particularly stretching out a raw vote margin to you know increase higher turnout, I think you got to feel pretty good about the night going forward. If she's doing a little bit worse, again, not anything you can't come back from. But I think you you know if you're her, you got to start being a little bit worried. Okay, so let me see if I can summarize this back as sort of a second hypothesis to test. Right. So the first was Trump is doing better with black voters in 2024. The second hypothesis, we see this a lot in pundits, is that Kamala Harris is making inroads among white voters, particularly college-educated white voters. Again, large gender gap, but doing better among white men who are college educated. And so I I hear you to be saying that by looking at the rest, so we looked at the cities first to test the Trump thesis, to test the Harris thesis, We look at the rest of those counties, Jefferson County, Kentucky, Marion County, Indiana, and if they show Kamala Harris doing better in 2024 among educated white voters, again, that would tend to confirm that thesis, and you would think that she would do better in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, and right the the areas that that surround that, that are not the core cities of Detroit, Philadelphia, Milwaukee, but the the white suburbs that surround them. Is that right? Yes. I mean, these places are obvi- are obviously diversifying. So there's and mm-hmm. you know there's a lot of a lot of folks moving in, a lot of folks moving out. But for the most part, most part that you know thesis is correct. These areas are majority or super majority white, um, and so if she's doing a little bit better or a lot bit better as President Biden did compared to 2016, you got to feel reasonably confident that Philadelphia. The Collar counties in Philadelphia, Metro Detroit, and Milwaukee Metro are going to be swinging left, right? And and I I should add we we didn't really unpack this, but one of the things we've seen, for example, from from five thirty eight, is that demographics tend to trump borders, right? In other words, if suburban voters outside of cities in Kentucky and Indiana are trending slightly towards Harris, that that tends to be illustrative of what suburban voters outside of cities in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin are likely to do, right? It would be surprising to see similarly situated folks across state borders behave totally differently, totally independently than, you know, that they're similar folks in, even though that those folks are being drowned out in a larger sea in, in these red states. Correct. Okay. So that's kind of points one and two. Tell me about bucket number three. So I think there's this there's this notion that's somewhat false that the Republican Party is a rural party. Obviously, they dominate with rural voters. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. But where they really make their most hay is the exurbs um, mm-hmm. or areas that are suburban or you know somewhat rural but still have like a decent you know number of people. These tend to be areas maybe forty five ish minutes away from city centers. I think is the okay. best way I could describe it, but and that's just because there there are more people living there. <laughs> yes, okay. um, it's not because they in certain cases they you know do as well as they do in rural areas, but for the most part, you know these areas are like sixty forty to seventy thirty Republican, but they're giant, and so Pennsylvania ha- has these you know 
kind of Lancaster County uh, is a little bit different, but Lanc- you know, Lancaster County, Berks County, Westmoreland County, et cetera. Uh, Michigan has, you know, these, bi- these bigger counties, Macomb County, you know, as you start to get kind of further out, Livingston County, uh, sort of outside Detroit, uh, and Wisconsin, mm-hmm. you know, Washington County, et cetera, kind of as you get outside of Milwaukee. Indiana has a same, same sort of deal. Probably the most notable, uh, although this is not, Hamilton County, Indiana is probably the most notable example of this. Although okay. it doesn't really fall into completely into bucket three, it's kind of split between bucket three and bucket two. But again, super, super white, super, super college educated, but swinging left. So in 2016, uh, President Trump actually won this county by 19%. In 2020, he won it by seven. You're going to okay. want to take a look at Hamilton County, Indiana as sort of like a bellwether for how those exurban counties are going to go. Again, if Vice President Harris is doing a little bit better, then I think you got to feel reasonably confident about the suburbs, but also the exurbs in those states. Now, Hamilton County, Indiana is kind of its own thing because it's split between bucket two and bucket three. Mm -hmm. But the true exurbs um, in Indianapolis are, or surrounding Indianapolis, I should say, are Boone County and Hendricks County. Okay. So these counties in 2020, just for reference, were super, super, super Republican. So President Trump won these counties by 24 points and 19 points, respectively. Okay. Racked up huge raw vote margins, won won Hendricks County, Indiana by 21%, and Boone County by about 19%. Kentucky has their own version of these counties, but they they don't actually, it's kind of weird, they don't actually feed into the Louisville Metro, they feed into the Cincinnati Metro. Uh, sure. So there's because that's right counties. on the border of Eastern. Correct. Kentucky. Yeah. So that, there's three counties: Campbell County, Kenton County, and also Boone County in uh, Kentucky. Combined, President Trump won these counties by 31 percent and netted about 50,000 votes out of the three. So mm-hmm. you're going to want to take a look at those results. If Vice President Harris probably needs to be doing just a little bit better, uh, and if she is in those ca- in those fully completed counties, I think you got to feel good about her standing in, you know, say Berks County, Pennsylvania, or Livingston County, Michigan, something like that. Okay. So let me see if I can't spit back, because I think this bucket is a little more difficult to grasp intuitively because the pundits don't really have a clever, you know, soccer mom's name for this. But this is the growing trend towards people who used to live in suburbs moving to exurbs, right? As you put it, 45 minutes away from a downtown area. I have to imagine that trend has accelerated post-COVID as, you know, folks work from home, go into the office infrequently. You know, here in Maryland, we've certainly seen that. Uh, although, you know, obviously Maryland, a bright blue state. Uh, but but folks continuing to migrate outwards. And, and what I hear you saying is, These are Republican strongholds. They're going to stay Republican strongholds. But the question is, what is that margin? It dropped from about 30% in some of them to 25% to 20% in 2020. And if that trend continues or, or if it stays at the 2020 levels, again, this bodes well for Vice President Harris on election night because, you know, it denies Trump an an extra source of votes in fairly dense Republican areas, right? Like, you know, he certainly is going to win rural areas, 80, 20, 90, 10, but, you know, there might be 200 people that are out there in that area. Right. This is where Donald Trump is going to get the most voters, um, or he's going to net the most voters, I should say. Obviously, he's going to get killed in cities. He's going to do great in rural areas. As you said, rural areas don't tend to not have a lot of people. Now, he's going to killing them, don't get me wrong. But where he tends to make his most hay is in these sort of exurban areas. Um, like I mentioned, 45 minutes from the city. If he's doing worse here, um, particularly if his raw vote margins are coming down, he's probably got a problem. But if he's you know maintaining pace, I think he's in for a relatively good night. And what is the analytical reason to think that these areas are sort of continuing to drift leftward? So as you mentioned, you know, these areas typically, you know, sometimes were either rural areas or, you know, had a decent amount of population. But, it, you know, as you mentioned, post COVID, a lot of folks are moving to these areas, you know, working from home. And as folks move in, these folks tend to be more educated, especially if you're working from home. And so these, you know, like the three counties in Kentucky have about 35% college educated, you know, 
the college educated voters there are probably a little bit different than you're going to find in downtown Manhattan. But <laughs> if they continue swinging left as they did in 2020, it's really tough for Donald Trump to to win just because his margins are not going to be the same in those counties. And that's where he gets almost all of his votes out of. That makes sense. So in, in other words, it is these areas are changing. Correct. In some cases, they're diversifying. Can't, the, uh, just for reference, I have some clients in Kentucky, not, those areas not super diversifying, but they still are getting more democratic just by the virtue of college-educated voters moving in. Um, okay. Also, just side note for those folks who are interested in the Ohio Senate race, which should be all of you, <laughs> the Kentucky suburbs are extremely correlated with the Cincinnati suburbs. Uh, in the Ohio side of it. So the oh, that Cincinnati has sort of northern and southern suburbs and exurbs. The northern suburbs, Middleton County, Ohio, Warren County, Ohio. Uh, these are places that Donald Trump is going to run up his margins in, and Bernie Moreno is going to run up his margins in, who's the Republican Senate candidate in Ohio, I should clarify. But if Vice President Harris is doing a little bit better in the Kentucky exurbs, it probably means Sherrod Brown is as well. And you've got to you know, those things are also correlated. So just a little bonus fun fact for you. Sounds good. So let's summarize kind of this third bucket, the exurbs bucket. Tell me what counties I should be looking at in Kentucky and Indiana and, you know, what numbers I should be looking for. So in Kentucky, as, as I mentioned, Boone County, Kentucky, Kenton County, Kentucky, and Campbell County, Kentucky. President Trump in 2020 won these by a combined 25%. Mm -hmm. So if his margins are going down a little bit from 2020, uh, I think Vice President Harris has to feel reasonably confident. But if they're maintaining you know, certain strength, I, I think she should start feeling a little bit worried. And uh, the Indiana equivalent is Boone and Hendricks County, sort of west of Indianapolis. Okay. Let's move on to bucket number four. Uh, this is an area that I think, you know, obviously gets attention every year, and that is counties that are home to colleges. So talk about that a little bit. So college counties obviously give huge margins to Democrats just because, you know, super educated, tend to be super young, and, you know, Democrats are going to win those voters m most of the time. Mm -hmm. So there are four counties, three in Indiana, one in Kentucky which you want to look at to discern some trends. So the first one, Fayette County, Kentucky, home of Lexington, home of the University of Kentucky. Again, super blue county, safe, safe dem. You know, Harris is not going to have any trouble winning this county. But, you know, there has been some sense that she might perform a little worse than President Biden did amongst younger voters, or that there's going to be a large protest vote, you know, over Israel-Palestine, mm -hmm. over a couple of other things, but mostly Israel, Palestine. And so these counties give us an opportunity to test that thesis. If her margins are maintaining fairly steady in Fayette County, Kentucky, which she won by 21 points in 22, and Jill Stein is not getting more than, you know, 2% of the vote, I think she's got to feel, feel relatively confident. Mm -hmm. If her margins dip a little bit and, you know, Jill Stein is eating 3 to 4% of her vote, I think she has to feel relatively relatively worried about, you know, yeah. Center County, Pennsylvania, Wanda Shaw County, Michigan, Lans Lansing County, Michigan, a couple of other things. It's not, uh, let me clarify, it's Ingram County, Michigan, Lansing's the city where Michigan State University is. Right. Indiana has three of these counties, home to Notre Dame, Indiana, and Purdue. Um, mm -hmm. Vice President Harris won these by a combined 10%, but that's a little bit skewed by the outlying areas in uh, St. Joseph's County and Tippecanoe County, Indiana. She's going to have no trouble winning these counties again. But again, have look at Monroe County, Indiana, look at Tippecanoe County, uh, Indiana, and look at St. Joseph's County, Indiana. If Jill Stein is, is doing a little bit better than she did in 2020, that's probably not great for Harris. But if she's maintaining form and turnout is relatively similar to 2020, I think she has to feel good about the Rust Belt College counties. Okay, let me see if I can't summarize bucket number four. Another thesis that is popular among the pundits is that Kamala Harris is going to have 
more difficulty motivating young voters in 2024 than perhaps Joe Biden did in 2020, not the least of which are campus protests over the situation in Israel and Gaza right now. So one of the ways that we can test that thesis is by looking at four counties, three in Indiana, Monroe, Tippecanoe, and St. Joseph County, and one in Kentucky, that is Fayette County, because those are homes to Midwestern universities. And if the if the campus vote is declining for Harris, it's going to show up in those counties and we'll get sort of an early look at that. And we'll know, is Harris going to have, you know, sort of the typical Democratic margins with college voters or is there an enthusiasm problem? Is there is there something else that would that would eat into her vote totals? Yes. OK, let's talk then about bucket number five. I'm, I'm really I thought this was a really interesting insight. So why don't you talk a little bit about this? So bucket number five is, is titled small cities, particularly in the Rust Belt. There are these, you know, these older school, like industrial towns, like Fort Wayne, Indiana, for instance, these areas tended to vote for Obama, though not always. Obviously in 2016, heavy, heavy swing to Trump and contributed to his narrow win to the White House. Mm -hmm. And President Trump tends to run up pretty strong margins in these, in these counties. In my in Indiana, for instance, he he won these these cities and counties by about 16, 17 percent, depending on how you define them. And so he's netting a, a decent number of votes out of them. Vice President Harris has, you know, tried to make, you know, some inroads with the limited suburbs they have there. And maybe she'll do a little bit better with white work, working class voters, which these cities tend to be full of, especially in the Rust Belt. Right. Um, and so. What you're going to want to do is kind of look at cities that may, you know, Fort Wayne, Fort Wayne, Indiana, Muncie, Indiana, Anderson, Indiana, Terre Haute, Indiana, where these counties are, where, you know, where these cities are located. And if President Trump is maintaining his 2020 margin, he's not actually doing a little bit better. That probably means that he's not going to do better in places like Flint, Michigan, which he didn't win in 2020, but he still performed better than most Republicans did. You know, he's not going to do better in Kalamazoo. He's not going to do better in Erie. Uh, he's not going to do better in Scranton as a, you know, everyone's favorite political <laughs> town. Um, and so you want to watch his margins in these counties. If they're maintaining steady, it probably means he's not turning out any new voters. He's not flipping any, vo any more voters in these counties. And it means he's going to probably struggle to win the rest of the Rust Belt, especially because he's probably going to do worse amongst college educated voters. Okay. So let me see if I can't summarize this one back. And that is, we tend to think of cities as being democratic strongholds, but particularly in the Rust Belt and particularly in the swing states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, there are a lot of these small cities, right? Like you mentioned, like Scranton, Pennsylvania, or Eau Claire, or Green Bay, Wisconsin, right? And those are counterintuitive results. They're areas where Republicans, and in particular Donald Trump, has have done much better than the margins that Democrats put on in large cities. And so what you're saying is, let's take a look at some of these counties. Let's take a look at Fort Wayne, Indiana, which is in Allen County, Indiana, and see and test that hypothesis. And basically, I think from looking at the data that if Kamala Harris is losing Fort Wayne, Indiana by 15%. You, you got to feel good about that. That yeah, well, looks like, yeah, go ahead. If Kamala Harris is losing Allen County, Indiana by about 10%, I think she has to feel really good about that result because okay. it means you're not seeing any erosion with white working class voters in small cities and states that actually matter. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we love you, Indiana. You actually matter. But in states that actually matter in the Electoral College, you're not seeing any erosion. If she's losing Allen County, uh, Indiana, by about 15 percent, she probably is seeing some erosion from 2020 and she should worry. OK, and so let's move on to the last bucket. I'm going to spoil that because this is the one everyone's been waiting for us to get to, because it is how at least uh, a lot of East Coasters tend to think about Kentucky and Indiana. And that is, aren't these rural states with tons of rural voters? Right. So as you know, uh, rural areas are going to give Donald Trump insane margins in 2020. The areas that will close at 6 p.m. in rural Indiana voted for Donald Trump by about 43 percent. And in rural Kentucky, it was 48 percent. Um, okay, that's it, a lot. It, depend, <laughs> it depends how you define them. But again, like huge, huge margins in these areas. Vice President Harris ain't winning these areas. I hate to disappoint the, some of you, but she's just not. But watch Trump's, watch two things in these counties. 
watch his margins. If they're going down a little bit, I think that signals that, you know, she might have succeeded in flipping back a couple of white working class voters, which is going to show up in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. But watch turnout as well. Um, One of the reasons that Trump kept the election close-ish in 2020 in these states um, was he did a really, really nice job of getting out sort of lower propensity white working class voters in these rural areas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these counties are very small and they just don't have that many votes to cast. So they tend to report really, really quickly. And you'll be able to see like if in Huntington County, Indiana, there were 17,000 votes last time and there were, you know, 16,000 this time. That actually bodes pretty poorly for him because it uh-huh. means that it, it means that his margins, his raw vote margins, maybe not percentages, but raw vote margins in, you know, rural Pennsylvania, rural Michigan, rural Wisconsin are actually probably going to decline a bit, which means he can't win those states. So let me see if I can't summarize kind of this last bucket, because this is more about the turnout, more about the total vote numbers than it is the margins, right? Like these are tiny, tiny counties, not a lot of people. We're going to see results like 70, 30, or maybe even greater. 80, 20, 90, 10, yeah. depending where you are. Right. And so the question is, is the absolute turnout up from 2020 in these rural areas? Or, and, or, or flat from 2020. Or flat. Right. And okay. So let me see if I can't kind of go back, summarize all the buckets. Uh, I know there's a lot of information, but uh, like we said, we're going to put out a written post on this as well that I think is just really a fabulous guide to, you know, what to do in that hour between six o'clock and seven o'clock or the two hours between six o'clock and eight o'clock. Why not sit down and parse county and precinct level data? I know you and I are going to be doing that. So, uh, <laughs> Let's 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 talk about the hypotheses that can be tested. Kind of summarize. You you tell me if I've gotten anything wrong, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll take it on out of here. So, number one, uh, we can test the thesis that Donald Trump is going to erode into the Democratic margin among African American voters, particularly among Black men. We can do that by looking at uh, how Trump performs in Louisville and Indianapolis, right in these core African American neighborhoods. Number two, we can test the thesis that Kamala Harris might be doing better among educated white voters. We can look at the rest of those counties, Jefferson County, Kentucky, Marion County, Indiana, to look at the suburbs outside and see if Harris has cut into the white Republican margin in those areas. Number three, we can look at the exurbs. We can look at sort of demographic trends and see, are these areas turning left? Are they going to cut into the single largest composition of, you know, where Trump voters are located, is that margin going to go down? Number four, we can test to see if Kamala Harris uh, is going to have a a third party or protest vote or lack of enthusiasm among college educated voters, among college kids who, you know, get out and turn out and vote for Democratic candidates, because there are a bunch of those counties in, in Kentucky and Indiana. Number five, We look at this kind of small cities that occupy the Rust Belt because there are those cities like Fort Wayne in Indiana, where we can see uh, has Kamala Harris cut into the Republican lead there. And then number six, uh, we can look at rural voter data uh, and and what we're looking for there. Not margins. Harris is going to get destroyed. These are core Trump voters. But are they enthusiastic? Has there been a level of of turnout necessary to kind of push him over the top? And uh, and so we'll know. Maybe not how the election's going to go, but we'll know more than just, okay, two red blips show up on, you know, Steve Kornacki's map at six o'clock. Or, or what exit polls will tell you. <laughs> All right. Can I, just one flag for this. Um, make sure you wait for fully reported precincts. Kentucky reports mail votes first. And so if you're looking at the data coming in from Kentucky and you're very excited, actually wait till those counties fully report before you make any determinations about anything. Just a flag. Excellent advice. Okay, well, Joe Dye, thank you so much for joining us here on this bonus episode of Law and Cast, and I look forward to uh, running the written pieces and talking to you more between now and November 5th. Thank you for having me. Oh, that was a lot of fun. I really want to thank Joe Dye for being here and sharing some of the nitty gritty, the details, the geekiness on the data that I, for one, absolutely love. 
I hope all of you enjoyed this episode. If you did, if you have thoughts, either way, send us a message on Patreon or comment on Substack. We're going to read those. We're trying to figure out how best to bring you, you know, the content that we think you're going to enjoy, particularly as we're closing in on an awfully important presidential election and awfully important elections up and down the ballot. So thanks again. And uh, we will see you with more written content on Monday and with a regular episode episode of the show on Tuesday, just like normal. Thanks again, and uh, we'll see you then. Law & Chaos Podcast is a production of Raise It to Media, LLC, is intended solely as entertainment, does not constitute legal advice, and does not form an attorney-client relationship. This show is researched and written by Liz Dye and produced by Bryce Blankenagle. Law & Chaos Pod, copyright 2024, Raise It to Media, LLC, all rights reserved.